Good afternoon. My name is John Strope. I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag History Lecture Series. Lectures are held monthly on the third Thursday in the auditorium at the Nebraska History Museum at 15th and P Street in Lincoln. The programs have a live audience, are taped by City TV 5, are broadcast on government access channels in Lincoln, Omaha, Bellevue, Hastings, North Platte, Grand Island, Papillion, South Sioux City, and Beatrice, and are posted on YouTube. A detailed schedule for this series, as well as information about all of the Society's programs and services, can be found on the Society's website at www.nebraskahistory.org. If you are not already a member, I encourage you to join. Mem benefits of membership include subscriptions to Nebraska History Magazine and the Society's quarterly newsletter. Use of a microfilm reader printer in the Society's library archives to make free copies from microfilm. Free admission to the Society's seven historic sites. Discounts in the Society's landmark stores at the History Museum, the State Capitol, and Chimney Rock, and reduced fees for kids' classes. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for the financial support which allows us to tape and broadcast programs on public access television across the state and on the Society's YouTube page. To find that page, just type into your browser www.youtube.com slash user slash Nebraska Historical. There are over 140 past brown bags on YouTube. Our speaker is Nolan Johnson, and his topic is the features of Fort Atkinson. Nolan has worked at the Society for nearly 10 years in several capacities. For the last four years, he is the highway archaeologist. Nolan earned a Bachelor of Science in History and Anthropology from the University of South Dakota and an MA from NU in Anthropology. Just to let you know about asking questions, Nolan says to ask them anytime. Please join me in welcoming Nolan Johnson. Thank you, John, for that lovely introduction. Uh, we're going to talk about features at Fort Atkinson today. And first, we'll let everyone know what I mean by the word feature. A feature is just um, something left in the ground that humans have modified, um, like a fireplace or a post mold or a cellar, something like that. And so we'll talk about a bunch of different kinds. My clicker was working just a second ago. Anyway. There we go. Uh, just a little bit about Fort Atkinson first. Um, it was authorized as part of the Yellowstone expedition, which was supposed to um, build three forts up and down the Missouri River. Uh, due to budget constraints, only the southernmost Fort Atkinson was built. And it was um, the first military fort west of the Missouri River. Um, it was in response to uh, what were perceived threats to the fur trade from um, British interests out of Canada. And it was constructed in 1820. Um, before Fort Atkinson was built, the soldiers actually built another post called Cantonment, Missouri in the winter of 1819 down on the Missouri River floodplain. And in the spring of 1820, uh, this location flooded and uh, the soldiers were in rough shape. They were weakened by disease and lack of food and uh, over 160 people died that first spring. And so they moved up to the location of Fort Atkinson on the river, on the river bluffs and um, built a permanent settlement there in the spring of 1820. Uh, the fort was occupied for about seven years, from 1820 to 1827. Um, when it was built, it was built to house a thousand soldiers, but um, that number was reduced to six or seven hundred for most of its occupation. 
Um, the soldiers built a barracks quadrangle, which has been reconstructed up there today. Um, it has bastions and gates and sally ports, um, and it's been reconstructed very faithfully um, thanks to the work of archaeologists, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Um, but also at Fort Atkinson, there were many uh, other buildings. There's a lot more going on. Um, they farmed over 500 acres. They had herds of cattle, uh, pigs, chickens and dogs and horses, uh, and they built dozens of buildings, barns, and uh, a distillery, a dairy, um, a sawmill, and a gristmill, and n numerous storehouses and cellars and all sorts of things, and it actually looked more like a frontier town uh, than a fort, and the idea behind it was the military wanted this place to be self-sufficient so the soldiers were able to grow their own food and, and basically take care of themselves because they were so far away uh, from any other any of the other army posts. And this is a drive from 1820 of the north half of the fort. Um, there's some interesting things on here you can see which we'll talk about when we talk about the features. You can see the bastion up here with the cannons and then down here um, you can look that there's a tunnel under the barracks you can see right here. So uh, to get into the east side of the fort you went through this underground tunnel which to me is it's super cool to have a you know a secret tunnel under your fort. Uh, in the middle here's the powder magazine, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, a little bit about the archaeology at Fort Atkinson. Um, the historical society where I work was involved in excavations periodically since uh, '56. Um, the state purchased it in 1964 to be a state historic park. Um, a lot of these features we're going to talk about have been excavated, but some still do remain in place. And the features do cover quite a large area, a lot bigger than the reconstructed buildings there are today. And here's a map of some uh, features that are no longer in extant, but were uh, their locations were recorded by um, early settlers and uh, people who came to settle Fort Calhoun after Nebraska became a territory. Um, and these are fort related, excuse me, fort related structures. Uh, these are brick concentrations there, and one over here that were some sort of building. Uh, there's, there's a spring over here. That's where soldiers probably got most of their water. Um, there was a couple burials of um, fort, fort people that were in sort of weird locations, one here and then one here. And the green dot, uh, when they widened this road, they uh, uncovered a lime kiln where the soldiers were burning limestone to make um, lime and lye for mortar and other purposes. Uh, and the features of Fort Atkinson, there's about 210 recorded features. Um, like I said, post molds. Uh, there's 41 fireplaces, 34 cellars, um, 11 things that relate to stuff after the fort, um, 11 outhouses, um, 16 numbers were just left off. I don't know why, but that happens sometimes. And there were two uh, Native American features um, dating from a thousand years old or so, so that the location has been occupied for lots longer than the fort has been there. Uh, here's one of the earlier maps um, from the fort from 1964 showing you some of those features. Um, you can see there's a powder magazine that was excavated. That's a fireplace right there. Some of these are cellars. And then the next slide will show us that same map that I put on top of the air photo and you can see the reconstructed barracks and uh, the bastions up there and it lines up pretty well. Some of the later maps line up better but this is just one way um, that Fort Atkinson, the old information can be used in new ways and it, it really helps when we talk to people about the fort uh, to visualize where all this stuff is and to think about you know just walking around when you're out there on the fort there's all these things that are still under the ground or were under the ground when it was excavated. And the first four features we'll talk about are 1, 23, 30, and 32. Um, doing this presentation, I, I tried to find a good way to organize it, feature number in order, location, years they were excavated, and there was no good way. So we're going to bounce around and you'll just have to bear with me. But uh, you can see the features are labeled on here, uh, feature 1 and 32 and 30 and 23 is right in here. And there's just, again, that same map on an air photo, so you can really see there's the barracks, the north barracks and the south barracks. 
and the East Barracks isn't reconstructed because it's too close to the bluff line and um, it just wouldn't be safe. But all the things we're going to talk about right now are right in here. Ah, and here's, there's all these old great excavation photos. Um, and this is showing us one of the dirt cellars underneath the barracks. The circles you can see on the bottom are post molds to uh, help hold the floor up over top of the cellar. And this was just a dirt walled cellar. Um, and each of the rooms in the barracks where the soldiers stayed all had these big cellars for them to store food or you know, ammunition or whatever they needed to store because uh, they needed more space. And this one right here, Feature 23, was a building that was built into the bluff line, like dug into the bluff, and uh, it was walled in planks, and uh, we think it might have been an ice house or a root cellar. The pictures, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to get an idea, but you can see um, it's pretty big, and there's bricks and uh, other debris down at the bottom. And when they were excavating uh, the fill, the dirt that filled back in when these structures collapsed was very different than the surrounding soil, so that's how they know how much to excavate. Uh, this is a brick sidewalk, feature 30. This was actually outside the barracks. Um, so the, apparently they needed sidewalks outside the barracks, but you can see it's very neatly laid on, uh, and even after, you know, 150 years in the ground, uh, you could, looks like you could still walk on it just fine, so that's pretty neat. Uh, this is another dirt cellar, but this one's interesting because at the bottom of it they found a jar, like a pickle jar maybe, and a funnel. Just the, when the soldiers abandoned the fort, they just left it in place. And the, and the archaeologist, that's the funnel, and there's your jar, um, just lying on the floor. So the archaeologists found that intact when they got there. And again, that was just in a dirt cellar under, under the barracks, under the east barracks. Uh, next. There's another cluster of features we'll talk about. Uh, feature 28 is the armorer's shop, and when that was excavated, um, it was very clear that it was a forge. There was lots and lots of burned stuff, real um, uh, heavy concentrations of bricks and limestone and stuff from the forge, as well as some other features kind of scattered around. You can see um, there's feature four. That's another cellar. Um, 17 is actually an outhouse pit as you might expect you need. And 15 was uh, a, a, a different kind of feature we'll talk about. Again, this is 28. This is kind of an overview of the armor shop. Um, some of these photos are not, it's hard, you gotta use your imagination more, but you can see those big circles are post molds. Um, that big spot kind of in the middle um, is where the forge was. And uh, in the notes it says all that was just burned the ground was burned bright red from being under the forge in the blacksmith shop for so long. <clears throat> this is feature four. This is another one of those root cellars. You can see the post molds going across right here and then right here in front. And this is actually the doorway <coughs> going off down to where the bluff slopes. And again, this was another structure that was dug halfway into the ground and then roofed over, probably to store um, roots, root vegetables. We know the soldiers grew um, acres and acres, there's, talk, there's, there's records of them growing 40 acres of potatoes and almost as many turnips and radishes and things like that so they'd have uh, vegetables over the winter time. And the next feature is feature 15, which is an area where um, when they excavated they found lots of burned limestone and lots of burning. And we think right here, uh, because this is so close to a couple of outhouses that they also excavated, they were probably burning limestone to make lime to throw down into the outhouses to help with sanitation, which is, I mean, the, the, that shows up archeologically, which is not something that goes into the written military records. So there are some things that only archeology span can tell us, even at these really well-documented historic sites. <clears throat> and this is 17, you can see this, whoop. This lucky gentleman uh, got to dig the bottom of the outhouse. You can see he's pretty far down. Uh, you know, if he's five feet tall, five or six feet tall, that thing is seven or eight feet deep. Um, and outhouses are real great places to find stuff. People throw all kinds of artifacts down in there. So there's just lots of material to be found. And an interesting, <laughs> while we're talking about outhouses, the interesting side note at Fort Atkinson um, with, you know, hundreds of soldiers and civilians there, uh, as far as archaeologically, we haven't found enough of these outhouses. There should be lots more, and there probably are out there somewhere, but we just haven't found them yet. 
Uh, and the next feature is feature 22. Um, you can see that's the corner, the southeast corner of the reconstructed barracks. So this one is quite a ways outside. Um, and when we think about Fort Atkinson, you know, you might just think of the barracks square, which is what we see on TV as a square fort to, to, to defend. But again, there were lots and lots of buildings outside of that. And this is one of them. And this one would have been real down low, close to the river um, in 1820. But when they excavated this, um, there was lots of burn, burn, again, burn material and metalworking debris. So this is probably another blacksmith area. Um, and whether this was used at the same time as the other feature 28 we talked about, the armor shop, we don't know. It could have been used congruently or uh, one after another. We're just not sure. But there were at least two and probably three um, blacksmiths operations at Fort Atkinson. Here's another feature down, down pretty far away, or far away from the barracks. You can see when they excavated, uh, this line of bricks was intact in the ground. So that lets us know that there was some kind of structure there. And th this location was, was confusing for the archaeologists because there was um, a lot of artifacts that dated to after the fort. And we know from early records of Fort Calhoun, there was um, brick making operations down in this area. So that might, this might represent a, a later brick kiln or brick store house or something. But then there was also deeper pits full of ashes and fort related material. So there's probably two things going on in this one location. Uh, the next section is here kind of back in the middle of the East Barracks. And uh, we have Feature 24, which again is, is uh, going to be that underground entrance to the, to the fort. And feature 21A there is a, a pretty well-preserved um, limestone fireplace. And that's right here. You can see the H-shaped H fireplace. And we know from uh, excavation that the, you know, an interior wall ran right through the middle of it. So this fireplace had one chimney, but was, it would serve two rooms, allowing them to an economical use of their materials so they didn't have to build a chimney for every room and a fireplace for every room. They could build these double ones. And there, there's lots of these double fireplaces at the fort. And here's a close-up of uh, how that was preserved when they excavated it. You can see pretty clearly um, the hearth right here where they would have done their cooking and stuff. And again, when it was excavated, the dirt in that middle section was just burned you know, bright red and baked super hard from being underneath fires for, you know, the seven years the fort was occupied. And again, uh, this isn't the greatest picture, but this is when they excavated that tunnel under the fort. This is the, pic this is the picture I could find of it. And I know from the records that um, the tunnel had limestone on the floor and steps inside it, limestone steps, and the walls uh, were planked over to hold everything in place. So it was pretty substantial construction to uh, basically get people down from the river bottom up right into the parade grounds of the fort. Uh, next, we'll, we'll jot down here to the southeast corner. Um, the superintendent of Fort Atkinson, John, uh, calls this weird corner, and so I needed to mention that. Uh, this corner is constructed differently than anywhere else in the fort. Um, we don't quite know why. Uh, it's lots more substantial. There's a big brick cellar, which you can see, which is, yeah, we'll go, which is right here. Um, this is the only brick line cellar like this at the fort. All the other ones are just dirt. Um, there's also a, a boulder foundation under where the walls would go. Uh, the fireplaces are better constructed and, and um, better well preserved. And uh, there's also brick sidewalks out in front of it. Now, I heard some muttering from the crowds about this being officer row. And that's true. The, the um, lieutenants and things probably did live down here. But also, we know from uh, historical records that in 1825, uh, a hurricane, they called it a hurricane, which probably was a tornado, struck the fort. So maybe this is where they had to reconstruct part of it after it damaged. Um, I think this is where they started building the fort and decided this is way too much work. And then they moved down to a more economical um, system to make the rest of the fort. But that's something we don't know, and we might not ever be able to find out exactly why this is so much different. But an interesting find 
uh, in that dirt walled cellar was this uh, pike head that was just on the floor, and when they excavated it, it was just laying right there. So that was probably overlooked because when the soldiers left, um, they basically took anything that wasn't nailed down, they took with them to move to their new quarters down in Kansas. But that one got, maybe that was buried up on the dirt floor, we don't know, but they did forget it, so we got to find it. What is it? A pike head, like for stabbing things, like a lance head. Not not um, not like a bayonet to attach to your gun, but an actual an actual lance. Um, and again, this fireplace you can see this one you know brick and this is real square. And compared to that limestone one we saw earlier, this one's different and it looks like more care went into um, went into creating it. So again, we don't quite know why this one was 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 this area was different, but it is so. Um, next, we'll jump to the other corner up here where the Northwest Bastion is. Uh, and there's some interesting features up there, too, we'll talk about. This is another one of those dirt cellars. This one wasn't excavated completely. Uh, but what's interesting is there's this blob right here. And it doesn't look like much, but if you read about the blob, it turns out that at the bottom of this cellar, there was um, a pile of lime and um, the remains of a barrel. So basically, a barrel full of lime was just left to rot in this cellar. And we know also from some cellars, you can see archaeologically, and from um, the, the, the written records that they would make this lime, which is kind of like whitewash, to plaster over the walls of the cellars to help keep them clean and hold it up. So they were probably just had it down there in the cellar to do that cellar and just left it there. And then so we were able to find that archaeologically, which again is, is pretty interesting. Uh, another another feature here up kind of in the north section uh, is feature 48, which is right here. Um, these are maps um, from a publication from uh, 1979 from an archaeologist who worked at the historical site, Gail Carlson, who did a lot of work uh, on Fort Atkinson, and he compiled sort of all the things that had been done up till then in, in one volume, which is real helpful for, for, for me to, to kind of reconstruct what happened at Fort Atkinson. But um, this, again, it's a dirt cellar. And you can see from the picture, these bricks are more or less intact. And uh, what we're pretty sure happened here is that when the fort was abandoned, they just left it standing. And so at some juncture after it was abandoned, this brick was probably, this is a brick chimney, just fell into the cellar. And then because it fell into the cellar and was covered over with dirt, it was better preserved than the rest of the chimneys. And so it remained, you know, more or less how it, intact, except tipped over, uh, for us to find, not us, for other archaeologists to find. What is Bastion? Bastion, uh, Bastion is, here, let's go back. We, Bastion is, um, because the fort was square, that's a good question. You know, we're going to talk about Bastions in a couple slides, and we'll, we'll get to that. So, yeah, the bricks. <coughs> Uh, another feature here, kind of in the middle, feature 41, uh, I picked this one because I like this picture. It's just this big smear of bricks and limestone, and this is, this is a spot where uh, a brick fireplace and a brick and limestone fireplace and chimney um, has been disturbed. Uh, all of Fort Atkinson uh, was farmed for a long time, and so um, anything that was close to the surface got kind of messed up through agriculture, so that's why the one chimney that fell into the cellar is so much better preserved uh, than this guy, which is just kind of spread out over kind of a large area. We still know what it was and kind of where it, w where it was originally, but it, the preservation is not near as good because it was closer to the surface. And feature 53 is the Northwest Bastion, and a bastion is just this protrusion from the fort. Um, at Fort Atkinson, they were upright logs. And again, we know that because when they excavated, when the logs rot in the ground, they live real pretty circles, dark circles that stand out from their surrounding soil. So you could see those in a line when they excavated. And the bastion was designed so you could have one cannon facing this way and one facing this way. And there's another one down here to go this way and this way. And basically, 
to use a fancy military term that allows you to have inflating fire along your walls so you could shoot down your walls to keep people from climbing up them. Um, now, Fort Atkinson was never attacked. Um, they enjoyed good relations with the surrounding Native Americans, and um, basically the people there were just farmers. Uh, they did very little actual soldiering, and they had a, uh, they had a real problem with desertion, uh, partly because all these people ran away from family farms to join the army for fun and excitement, and then got shipped to the middle of nowhere and told, go, you know, go mine the hogs. <laughs> so the people, a lot of people decided they would take off. But most of them ended up coming back because they were hundreds and hundreds of miles from anywhere, so they had nowhere else to go. But when the bastion was excavated, there's actually lots of kind of individual features. You can see this nice map. These are all those post molds I was talking about, the ones they could see really well. Uh, they had a fireplace in there. Um, so if you had to stay out there on guard, you could stay, you know, not freeze. And then there was, there's um, little features here, and this is where the cannons would have sat to shoot out. So again, we could see that archaeologically that there was special construction in the walls um, where the cannons would go so that you know and that, again that's been reconstructed very faithfully up there and archaeology allows us to get at real sometimes we can get at real great details of how things looked in the past um, and you know there are documents and we saw some drawings of how the fort looked it was very generalized of kind of you know the army has plans build your fort like this and whether the people actually building it follow that plans you know, that's, that's a different story, but archaeology can't lie to us about how things actually look. So that's what a bastion is in. And here's a picture of when it was, when it was excavated. You can see this is the line of those logs. Um, you can see it's kind of comes to a point, and there's the fireplace remains right in there. So again, you can just see how that looked. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures before the advent of... Uh, aerial photography or uh, OSHA safety rules. Uh, this is what archaeologists would do. You'd have a huge ladder that went straight up and you get your four most strapping uh, young assistants and you just climb up, climb up it and look down and take pictures. Um, it's wild how high they would get with some of these things, but I would not do that personally. <laughs> I've done it with a loader track. You just raise the bucket up. It's much better, much better than that. But I love this picture. It's a great picture of how archaeology was practiced. And this would have been uh, late 50s, early 60s. So I think that's a good, that's a great photo. <clears throat> Here's just another example of um, how we can use these maps of these features and portray it to, to new generations. This is a map from, again, the. this is how the excavation stood in 1971, and this is from a publication that was published in 79. Um, and you can see it's a very, you know, it's a great drawing. Um, you can see the the line, you know, the dotted lines there are, are, are where the fort walls were and all the features are labeled. And these long linear things are where excavations took place. And it's great, but, you know, you put that on top of the air photo, and suddenly it has a lot more meaning to everyone. You can see how the features relate to the, to the barracks and how, as we talked about before, how far away some of these things are. Um, and we'll get to some of the more external features here in just a second. But I really like, I don't know, this really excited, I really like doing this, lining up these old excavations on the air photos. I think that's pretty neat. And uh, when, I, when I do, uh, I give tours of the archeology span at Fort Atkinson over Labor Day weekend. And um, this really helps when I'm talking to people on site uh, to show them this map and they can, you know, stand in the feature and be like, we are right where a building used to be or we are right on top of one of these cellars. And, you know, you can kind of see the recognition come to their faces that, hey, you know, we're sort of experiencing history, which is pretty neat. Uh, and again, using some different photos, uh, this is from 64, 1964. You can see this, you know, cornfield. Uh, this is right after the state purchased the land. And so the, this is the first year that they were able to get out into the agricultural fields and really do some extra work. Um, this is the powder magazine right in the middle of the fort, the excavation in the middle of the fort we'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, I want you to look at, you know, there was a farmstead right on top of the southeast corner of the fort. So we are, uh, we're very lucky that it's as well preserved 
uh, as it is. But there's a close-up of that um, powder magazine excavation. And so in the 60s, they excavated part of it. But in the 90s, um, archaeologists were like, were thought, I wonder if there's anything left. So they used um, a conductivity meter, which basically runs electricity through the ground and measures how much resistance there is in the ground. And you can see very well uh, that rectangle. And that's the remains of the foundation trench of that building from, uh, at that time, 170 years ago. It's still clear as day when you use that technology. And then this is a map of them excavating. That's the foundation trench from that powder magazine. And uh, at the bottom of that trench, the soldiers took huge slabs of limestone and laid them horizontally to hold up the weight of the powder magazine because the, the powder magazine had um, limestone walls two feet thick and like 10 feet tall to contain any potential explosions because that's where they stored all their black powder. So it was a massive construction, which is why it shows up so well, you know, even, even, even then. Uh, but what's interesting is this little feature right here, right in the middle of the powder magazine, was actually a burned area like a campfire right in the middle of the powder magazine. And this is uh, an outhouse pit right, in, right outside the front door of the powder magazine. So you don't have to be an archaeologist to know well, those two can't think. Those two things can't be related, <laughs> because you can't have a fire in the middle of your powder magazine. So we do know that um, when the first settlers came to Fort Calhoun, that that the walls were still standing, and they used it as a landmark. And we know one of the first settlers built his cabin right next to that, so that outhouse and that campfire re relate to you know early early settlement in the 1850s. But um, it's just interesting that. We can see that depth in time archaeologically, you know, and see how um, people use the same spot through time. And there's uh, just again that map on the air photo. And, and if you ever get up to Fort Atkinson, the powder magazine has been reconstructed so you can see how, how massive the construction is. Uh, these are features 111 through 120, which were just skipped. Uh, so I thought I'd put in this blank photo because. <laughs> It amuses me, a little feature, feature humor there for everyone. Uh, but like I said, the numbers go up to 227, but there's only 210 features, so I don't, I don't know. Uh, the next thing, again, I th in the 90s, um, they did a lot of work outside the barracks quadrangle, and all these blobs are, um, they burned that area in 1996 and went out and surveyed it archaeologically. And those are all um, scatters of uh, bricks and glass and nails and things. So they're probably all remains of buildings, the big ones are. So you can see you know, how many structures there were outside the barracks. And all these little circles um, we'll get to in a second are um, dugouts into the side of the bank, root cellars or ice houses or stuff, stuff like that. So you know, again, when we think about a fort, Fort Atkinson doesn't really fit that model because, like I said, it was more of a, a, a town. It was just a town that happened to have a fort in the middle of it. Uh, one, of the, one of the buildings that was actually excavated completely is the commanding officer's quarters. Uh, and there's an artist reconstruction of what it might have looked like. It's a pretty substantial frame structure, which is why they think the commanding officer might have lived there. It could have been another high-ranking official. We're, we're not quite sure. But uh, what's interesting about this for or this building is um, it had a cellar, which in itself is not all that exciting. But above the cellar, there was um, still you could still see the remains of some logs laid in a, a rectangle shape, like a pen, like a log pen they called it. And um, you know we don't know what that was for exactly, whether that was to level out the floor of the building or to hold up the walls of the cellar. Uh, we're not quite sure, but that doesn't, that we didn't see that kind of construction anywhere else at the fort either. Uh, and here's a drawing of that cellar of that building. You can see the big crisscross area um, is the remains of probably the fireplace from the building that again fell into the cellar as it ended up just as a pile of rubble. Um, but again, because it's in the cellar, it's uh, it's better preserved for us to find. Uh, now we'll get to my favorite, my favorite, favorite feature at Fort Atkinson, uh, 134. Uh, one of the reconstructed buildings is the council house. 
And again, that was excavated completely. Um, and you can see the F, F numbers are feature numbers. These ones right here, there's five uh, limestone pillars that were used to um, level, level up the floor. There's two fireplaces. Um, there was a big room and a little room. The Indian agent who was attached to the military uh, expedition uh, lived in this room, and this was the, the place where he could meet with uh, visiting Native Americans. And uh, this is, again, that, that same excavation laid on top of the reconstructed council house, just so we can see how well uh, it's been, how faithfully it's been reconstructed. Uh, but that little, or that little green circle is a um, secret compartment that was under the fireplace when they excavated this location. And you can get see here, it says trap door right here. Uh, the Indian agent had in his fireplace a big iron plate, basically, and a hole under it. So if he wanted to, he could lift that up and hide his stuff in and shut the, gate, shut the top and start a fire and no one would be the wiser that he had, he had this secret compartment, which is pretty, you know, you don't often find, it's, archaeology's not like the movies, there's not secret passages and secret compartments and stuff all over, except when there is this time. A uh, quick question, what, what was the council house built at an angle? You know, he wanted to know why the council house is built at an angle. Um, the, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it might, it kind of follows the line of the bluff line, or it might just be to orient itself to the fort. Um, it's kind of hard to tell. There's another picture where we can see how it relates to the rest of the fort. Uh, but again, that's the artist's reconstruction. Uh, and again, I talked about uh, the work that was done in the 90s with some of the geophysical stuff and the, the burning and the survey. But again, you can see this is the map from the publication. And uh, it's, again, it's a good map. You can see what's going on. But again, when we put that map on the air photo, uh, it allows us to really visualize how substantial the fort was and how much was going on and to see just how everything relates to each other. And there's a council house, and, and you know, the fort, true north is pretty much straight up and down on these maps. So the, the fort is cockeyed too. Um, so I don't know if their, their construction was off or what, but, you know, they probably had a compass and were lining it up, but the bluff, whoop, whoop. you can see that the, the tree line marks the, the edge of the bluff where it slopes down, so, you know, that tips back this way. So who knows why they, why they did that, I don't know. But um, to find all these features, like I said, when they burned this all off and then went and surveyed and, and they could see the material just readily on the surface. Um, and a lot of them have never been um, tested archaeologically, so there's a lot of potential there for us to learn more about uh, what happened at the fort if we had questions about, you know, what each structure was for or if we were looking for, you know, specific things, uh, the dairy or the distillery or, you know, the, the schoolhouse or something like that, we would know it would be one of these buildings. Uh, and the, these circles over here, uh, these were all found with metal detectors. And again, um, a lot of them weren't inspected, uh, you know, dug into by the archaeologists, but we know they're there. And so in the future, there's, again, there's lots of potential. We can go out and, and, and perhaps learn some more about the fort. <clears throat> and, um, you know, archaeology is great, and all these features are great. and, and the, the, the exciting, the real excitement about Fort Atkinson to me is that uh, so much of it still remains uh, uninvestigated. So we can, the, the, in the future, we, we could, there's lots we could learn and there's lots we could do. And um, just, you know, just briefly, one of, one, of the, one of the one things we are doing and that I'm doing is trying to, you know, enlighten everyone who visits there that the fort was so much more than what's been reconstructed. And this, this map is just a map that uh, the, the Game and Parks has for people who, you know, it's just their visitor's map so people know where the parking lot is and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I've put as many features as I could fit on there. Um, some of them are too small to relate on that scale. But you can see the major ones. And so, again, when you, when you can, you know, when you can visualize um, 
how big this place is and how much was going on, it, it, it's really shocking to people that um, it's not their sort of classic TV Western view of a fort. And um, yeah, it's, I just think it's really neat. Uh, and here's just a picture of, you know, Labor Day weekend next year, you come out, you can see all this stuff on the ground. Uh, there's just me leading a tour and, you know, we're walking by one of these one of these features. And the, the first year I did it, there was a drought and we walked over one of those big, uh, this one right here, this one right here, uh, they mow this trail and we walked over there and sure enough, you know, there's brick fragments right in the trail of what remains of that structure. So, you know, when you can, sh it's really interesting when you can still see the tangible evidence of 200 years ago just staring at you on the surface and, and it's important to share that with all the visitors because I think it, it helps tell the story. Archaeology really helps fill out the story of Fort Atkinson. Uh, there's just another one um, showing people, and there's just a shameless plug for my children, uh, enjoying, enjoying the fort and the, the reconstructed barracks there. But that's it, and so um, if anyone has any questions, yes, you, sir. Well, regarding the, the buildings there at the fort that would experience over 2,000 visits per day, the outhouses, do archaeologists know what soldiers used for wiping back in those days? You know, the, the interesting question. He wants to know um, what the wiping procedure was for the soldiers out at the fort. And I, I do know they grew a lot of corn. So, you know, you've got all those leaves, maybe, or uh, corn, cobs. corn cobs. That's what my grandpa used to say. Um, so, or just, yeah, I don't know. I think that might be about the best you could do. So it's a good question, though. <laughs> yeah, you may. You mentioned some of the diseases and illnesses that they suffered, but I didn't see any of the features show a medical facility or, or a physician's facility. Oh, good question. She, um, we talked about how uh, a lot of the folks died during that first uh, spring during the flood. She wanted to know um, where, why we didn't talk about a hospital or a, 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 a clinic or whatever. Infirmary. Yeah, infirmary would be the military term. Uh, and that actually... There is one there. It's um, there's a one of the rooms right in here. W was the firm the infirmary, and they have um, it's re they have a lot of the old uh, medical equipment from that time is still in place, and it was just um, just one of the rooms in here. There was also uh, quartermaster's room, and um, a Cooper, a barrel maker, had his own room, and most of them were for the soldiers to live, but there were like special use rooms. In the in the fort. <clears throat> he wants to know where Council Bluff is. The this is the Council Bluff. This is where, this is probably where Lewis and Clark talk about meeting the Indians at Council Bluff or meeting the Native Americans. Um, the town of Council Bluff is um, not the, not that place. It's not that bluff. Um, we're pretty sure this is where they met. Um, there's a there's a memorial out at the fort to, to Lewis and Clark, um, and that and that meeting with the with the native groups. Um, you know we don't know that for sure, but from their journals and um, older maps of some of the earliest maps, the topography lines up best to right here. And some of the soldiers even talk about calling it Council Bluff, like they had read. They knew Lewis and Clark had been in the area, and they thought it was right here, too. Uh, how far is the river today, and where was it then? He wants to know uh, where the river is today and where it was in the 1820s. Um, the river today is about a mile and a half east towards Iowa. There's a really large uh, bottom land t to the east, but in the 1820s, the river ran right about right here, right at the base of the bluff line. And uh, what we didn't talk about, and maybe I, that's my failing on that, is that um, some of these bigger structures, and this feature right here is, a, is a, the remains of a wagon road. Um, so we know there were lots of wagons going up to the south gate. So somewhere down here, probably long since destroyed, were um, boat landings and warehouses and stuff where the sutler would have been able to store stuff and where the army could have unloaded supplies. A lot of supplies came up on keelboats, <coughs> and um, so that was probably down here. 
right because the river was um, very very close so they they came up brought their supplies up that way and then carted them by wagon you know into the fort and where they needed to go from there i understand the cemetery is probably on private land do you have any information on location and size of yeah the, he wants to know about the cemetery um, where the soldiers were buried we know about 300 somewhere around 300 people died um, when Fort Atkinson was in place. And yeah, the cemetery is a couple miles from there on private land. Um, and uh, um, that's pretty much where it stands. Some of them, some of the soldiers, like I said at the very beginning, there were a couple burials um, that were uncovered at various times that had um, soldier-like materials. One guy had a sword, one body was buried in a wood coffin with a sword which probably was a soldier. And there were a couple graves in the Fort Calhoun Cemetery that were labeled as um, reinterred soldiers that people had come across and, and just buried in the cemetery. But most, to the best of our knowledge, uh, most of the, the, the burials are still in place in, the, in that cemetery. Well, all right, everyone, thank you for coming. I hope we all learn something and come back next month.